This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Biology or Combined Science. These are pure factual recall questions based upon specification. You can download the questions from the description below and use these to make flashcards or to test yourself and then use this video to check that you know what the answers should be. A communicable disease is one that you can pass on to somebody else because it's caused by a pathogen. A pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease and it could be a virus, a bacterium, a protist or a fungus. Bacteria make you feel ill by producing poisons called toxins that damage tissues and make you feel ill, whereas viruses reproduce inside cells, causing cell damage. Measles is caused by a virus and it gives you a fever and a red skin rash. It spreads through the inhalation of droplets from sneezes and coughs. You can be protected from measles by vaccination, either with a single measles jab or more commonly with the MMR vaccine, which also provides protection against mumps and rubella. The initial symptoms of HIV infection are a flu-like illness, but if this isn't treated quickly enough, then the HIV will begin to attack the body's immune system, and this can lead to an autoimmune disease called AIDS. HIV can spread both through sexual contact and also through the mixing of bodily fluids, for instance blood if you're sharing needles. TMV is tobacco mosaic virus. It's called this because of the distinctive mosaic pattern that appears on the leaves of the tobacco plant when it's infected by TMV. Salmonella food poisoning is caused by a bacterium. In the UK, we vaccinate our poultry against this. If you do get salmonella food poisoning, then the symptoms include fever, abdominal cramps, diarrhea and vomiting. These are caused by the toxins that the bacteria release. Gonorrhea is another bacterial disease, and the symptoms include a thick yellow or green discharge and also pain while urinating. It's usually treated using antibiotics, but we have a slight issue in that the bacteria are becoming resistant to those antibiotics. Gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted infection or sexually transmitted disease, so it tends to spread through sexual contact. The spread of gonorrhea can be reduced by treating existing infections with antibiotics and also by using barrier methods of contraception such as condoms. Rose black spot is caused by a fungus and the disease causes purple or black spots to appear on the leaves and then after a little while the whole leaf turns yellow and drops early. This is an issue because both the spots and also the dropping of leaves is going to reduce the rate of photosynthesis and so that means that the plant doesn't have enough energy in order to be able to grow. In order to treat it, you can use a fungicide to kill the fungus, but often a better treatment is just to remove the affected leaves before the fungus can infect anything further. Malaria is caused by a protist, and this protist has a sort of double life cycle where it spends part of its life cycle in humans and part of it in mosquitoes. The symptoms of malaria include recurrent episodes of fever. In order to treat it, we mainly need to stop you from getting bitten by mosquitoes. So we try to prevent the mosquitoes from breeding, for instance by draining standing water, and also we use mosquito nets to avoid being bitten in the night. Your body is protected against pathogens by your skin, your nose, your trachea and your stomach. The skin acts as a barrier and prevents pathogens from getting in. The nose and the trachea both contain mucus, and that sticky mucus is going to trap those pathogens. Then cilia, tiny hair-like projections, waft the mucusy, pathogeny goodness so that eventually you swallow it and it goes into your stomach. And your stomach, of course, is full of hydrochloric acid, which is going to kill a lot of pathogens by basically denaturing the proteins in their coats. You've got two key types of white blood cells that you need to know about. There are your phagocytes, which do phagocytosis, where they engulf pathogens and then break them down. And then also your lymphocytes, which produce antibodies and antitoxins. A vaccine contains either a dead version of a pathogen or a disabled, immobile version of a pathogen. The way that vaccination helps is that it introduces your immune system to the pathogen without you actually being exposed to the disease. So essentially you have your white blood cells which produce antibodies in response to that pathogen and then you have special cells called memory cells which remember which antigens they've met in the past. So then the next time that they meet those antigens, usually when you meet the disease for the first time, they're able to produce those antibodies again but they produce far more of them and they produce them far faster than they would have done on initial exposure. Antibiotics are drugs that inhibit the growth of microorganisms like bacteria. 
The example named in your specification is penicillin, which was derived from the penicillium fungus by Alexander Fleming. Antibiotics are called specific if they only kill a narrow range of bacteria. They won't just kill any old bacteria. Antibiotics don't work against viruses. Viral infections can be treated using painkillers, which can be used to treat the symptoms. For instance, paracetamol or ibuprofen will lower a high temperature, but they don't actually kill the pathogen, whereas antibiotics do, but they can only be used on certain kinds of pathogen. It's difficult to treat viruses because they're found inside the cells, and so it's really difficult to damage the virus without also damaging the body's tissues. Digitalis is a heart drug which stimulates the cardiac muscle, and it's originally derived from foxgloves. Aspirin, on the other hand, comes from willow tree bark, which people used to chew as a painkiller in the days before everybody had easy access to doctors. Penicillin was discovered by Alexander Fleming when he managed to isolate it from the Penicillium fungus. Nowadays, most new drugs are synthesised by chemists in the pharmaceutical industry, but often the ideas for them come from plants. Before a new medical drug can be used with patients, it needs to be tested for toxicity, in other words, does it have side effects, for efficacy, does it actually make the disease any better, and also for the dosage. In preclinical testing, a new drug will be tested on cells, tissues, and live animals. In the clinical trials, we initially test the drug on healthy volunteers while we're looking for side effects, because we don't want to risk making someone who's sick even sicker by giving them side effects. And then once we've got through that stage of the clinical trial, we then move on to using patients. At the very start of the clinical trial, we give a very, very low dose, because we're watching out for side effects. And then if we don't find any side effects at that low dose, we can gradually increase it. The next stage of the clinical trial aims to find the optimum dose for the drug, in other words, how much should we be giving people? A double-blind trial is a trial in which the patients don't know whether they're really receiving the drug, and nor does the doctors. A placebo is a kind of fake treatment. So in the clinical trial, we need to have two groups. One are receiving the new treatment, and the others are receiving the placebo. So this could be something that has none of the active ingredient in it. For instance, a saline injection or a sugar pill. Monoclonal antibodies are produced from a single clone of cells from a hybridoma. The antibodies are able to target specific cells because they target one binding site on one protein antigen. This is a bit like the lock and key theory that you've learnt about with reference to enzymes. A hybridoma cell is made from lymphocytes joined together with a tumour cell. This means that the cell can rapidly divide because it's derived from a tumour and also it can make the antibody. Those lymphocytes come from a mouse. Large quantities of the antibody are generated by cloning the hybridoma cell so that there are many identical cells all making the same monoclonal antibodies. These antibodies can be used in diagnosis, for instance in pregnancy tests or in certain lateral flow tests where they're looking for a particular protein. Uh, they can be used in laboratories to measure the levels of a certain hormone or other chemicals in the blood. They can be used to identify a specific molecule within a cell or within a tissue by binding the monoclonal antibody to a fluorescent dye so that it can be visualised, and they can also be used in some cancer treatments. In these cancer treatments, the antibody may be joined to a radioactive substance or a toxic drug which is then targeted to the tumour cells. Monoclonal antibodies can be used within lateral flow immunochromatography assays to detect the presence or absence of a particular protein. And this can be used to diagnose everything from human pregnancy to a whole bunch of different diseases. So the way that the assay works is that there is one line which tells you whether or not the test is working, and a second line which tells you whether or not the protein is present. And in order for this to be achieved, we need three different sets of monoclonal antibody. Firstly, there must be a protein that we're trying to detect. So in a pregnancy test, this is the HCG hormone, which is secreted by the blastocyst in the early stages of pregnancy. Firstly, we have an antibody which is complementary or specific to this protein. And you can see here that it's been tagged with a little blue marker, although sometimes it's a fluorescent marker rather than a coloured one. Now this is going to be put into the sample well, 
And so when the sample is introduced, it's going to bind to it because they're complementary, and this is going to color the protein. So if you're pregnant and you have HCG in your urine, then that HCG protein is now colored blue. The second antibody is complementary to the first antibody, and this is how we're going to check whether or not the test is working. So this is anchored into the results window along that first line which tells us whether or not the test is working. So what happens is that when the sample is introduced and it's bonded to the first antibody, it's going to move through the lateral flow assay basically by capillary action. And whether or not there's any protein present, that second antibody is going to pick up the first antibody and so we'll know that the test is working. So that will cause our first blue line. The third antibody is specific to the protein that we were trying to diagnose at the beginning. So this is a different one, it's not coloured itself, but it's going to go there on a separate line and that's going to pick up whether any of this protein that's now been dyed blue is going to move through the assay or not. So if the protein is present, then antibody one is going to colour it and then antibody three is going to sort of catch it on the way past and therefore it will stay on the results line and we'll have a positive test. We're not using monoclonal antibodies as much as we'd initially hoped because there are far more side effects in their use in medicine than initially hoped. So at the moment we're using them a lot for diagnostic testing but far less for treatments where they're actually introduced into the body. Symptoms of plant disease include stunted growth, spots on leaves, areas of decay, growths or tumours, malformed stems or leaves, discoloration like the purple and black spots in um, rose spot or the, um, the yellow chlorosis that we see in tobacco and mosaic virus and also the presence of pests like aphids. You can identify a plant disease using a gardening manual, using laboratory ID of the pathogen or also using monoclonal antibody testing kits rather like the lateral flow assay that we just looked at. Aphids make plants unwell by sucking the sap from their phloem so they have less sugar because it's all been taken away from them and also by spreading certain viruses like potiviruses. Nitrate deficiency leads to stunted growth because the plant can't make enough protein. Chlorosis is the yellowing of the leaves that happens when chlorophyll breakdown happens. Plants have physical defences like their cellulose cell walls, the waxy cuticle on their leaves and also the bark that trees have around them which is made out of dead cells. Their chemical defences include antibacterial chemicals and also poisons to deter herbivores. Their mechanical adaptations include thorns, hairs, leaves that can sort of droop or curl up and also mimicry. That's it for this infection and response video. So thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found it a useful addition to your revision. The link for the questions is in the description below and if you did find it useful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Biology content coming soon.